So John, thank you so much for coming with the idea of a museum for our date. Oh yeah, I just thought this would be a, a great environment to, you know, just change things up a little bit. Yeah, it's funny that you picked the cutest section. It's one of my favorite paintings, like oh. style paintings. It's cute. Oh, okay, because I've actually studied a, a cubist painting up close that you want to hear about. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Right. Uh, this is Candlestick in Playing Cards on a Table by Georges Brock, and he was, and this was developed in 1910. Uh, apparently, this is definitely a cubist painting, more analytical than it is uh, just the other type of cubist. And as we notice right here in the image with these uh, flat areas kind of at the top, the whole purpose of that, according to scholars, is to not get the viewer to direct the attention in the background. He wants to focus more what's in the center. And the cubes are used to establish the, uh, what the overall image is. In this case, playing cards. I mean, candlestick and playing cards on the table. Uh, that's, that's, the, that's what the painting is. So obviously, he wants to focus on like the candlestick and the playing cards on the table. As we read through the cubes here, he's kind of established. There's a table here through this cube right here. And you see how it goes around. And as we see playing cards on here, and I believe that's the eighth of hearts in the Six of Diamonds, which is a pretty good hand if you're playing cards. <laughs> and as we look more towards the middle of the table, we can see the candle, the candlestick right there. I don't believe it's lit. However, if we notice there is a little bit brighter on the top, it may suggest a, a lit, but I don't think it's lit. And we can kind of see this face right here. Uh, I don't really know why he did that. Maybe, maybe it's because uh, he wanted to establish there's someone there, but I highly doubt that was his purpose. So, so some background of this painting, uh, he actually may have collaborated with Picasso. He and Picasso were very, very close to each other. And actually, this is one of the paintings that he did to probably impress Picasso and get, get a little closer to his knowledge, because Picasso was a big scene and Brock was really interested in, in him. So overall, there's some meanings behind these, this painting. Uh, the first that came to my mind is due to the playing cards, I assumed that maybe Brock may have had a gambling problem or he liked to play cards. And then I actually did some research on George's Brock back biography and there's no evidence that he had a gambling problem. It was just maybe he liked playing playing cards because in France back in his time period, it was illegal to gamble. <laughs> so I highly doubt it was a gambling problem. However, I think maybe he wanted to establish that no matter what, Maybe we can't get rid of gambling, and that can be seen with the cards. Cards there, I believe that's probably what he was trying to accomplish through this painting. And yeah, case closed. Well, that's really impressive that you know so much information about him. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, I know a little bit about um, surrealism. Oh, okay. Uh, I'd actually like to hear about a painting. So between 1926 and 1929, Dolly traveled to Paris where he met several other painters like Picasso, Miro, Marguerite, and a poet by the name of Paul Elliard. Um, and in the summer of 1929, Dolly painted the Accommodations of Desire, which shows his sexual anxieties and his remorse over an affair with a married woman by the name Gala, who was the wife of poet Paul Elliard. And Gala and Dolly would later marry, and Gala would manage his financial matters. And the year 1929 was a great year of fear and complex relationships for Dali, um, not just with Gala and with Eliard, but also with his father, who disapproved of the affair. And Dali, as you know, was, a, was an avid reader of Sigmund Freud's psychoanalytical theories. And just like things in dreams don't make sense, a lot of the things in the paintings don't make sense or don't connect to anything. And Dali would employ his own method called paranoic critical thinking, which was where he would tap into his subconscious in order to enhance his artistic activity. And the lines actually aren't painted, they're pasted. He cut the lines his from children's books. And in the painting itself, it's difficult to figure out what is painted and what is pasted. Um, so it makes the viewer really question the world of the painting and the painting as a whole. And the lines are supposed to represent desire, 
but Dali had a great fear of women, and it was said that he was actually a virgin when he married Gala. So the lion's head could instead represent the vagina tentata, which in ancient folklore was a vagina with teeth. So the lion's mane represents the pubic hair, and the roaring represents the teeth. And at the top right-hand corner, there is a silhouette of a woman, or the lower half of a woman's body, with a white patch on her lap, which symbolizes with with a with a white patch on her lap, with a silhouette of a lion's mane, which further enhances Dolly's sexual anxieties. And it's odd to see male lions associated with femininity, but for Dolly, femininity and masculinity weren't separated. So yeah, Dolly had a lot of sexual anxieties. What do you think? Oh, oh sure, sure. Oh, I got a text for my car's getting towed, so oh. I gotta go. Oh, See ya. Okay. But, but you don't even have a car. Okay, call me.